Okay, so this week we're going to be talking about the apostasy. Does anyone want to give me a recap kind of of what the apostasy was? Or sometimes it's referred to as the great apostasy. During the time which the apostles were spreading the gospel, Rome kind of became an, a real big enemy of the Christians. So they hunted down, and so did the Jews. They they killed the apostles, and faster than they could appoint apostles to replace them. And so, when the priesthood was lost, priesthood authority, um, they were the kind of you know, men that were Christians. You know, as far as they could, they kind of stepped in place of the of real. Priesthood authority, and I was reading in uh, I think it's uh, our heritage by it's, it comes with Jesus the Christ. It talked about how John was still on the island, John the Beloved, island of is it Sicily or it's Sicily, and someone else became the Pope. You know, something like so like lines of priesthood were disconnected, and then all these different Christian and Roman Empire converted to Christianity and it got all the Christians together and made the Nicene Creed and there's probably a few other creeds but mm -hmm. they all agreed on uh, certain beliefs kind of like articles of faith but they took a bunch of people's beliefs and just meshed them all together right. and so it became scrambled breakfast I don't know if anyone has had that but it doesn't it's not quite as good as is um, if you had separate breakfast, that's like taking your pancakes and scrambling them like eggs with your eggs and bacon with your eggs. Nose. <laughs> so right. Um, so just like you're saying, Rodney and um, Annika and Emma, right? So there's no, there was no standard, there was no authority to be able to determine what's going on, right? So you ha don't have priesthood, so people just start going with whatever they feel like, right? when it comes to doctrine, when it comes to church organization, when it comes to church structure. And what we're going to see is um, going from the first century, where you have the authority, all the way to the fourth century, in just that short period of time, all of a sudden you have church, the way churches run is completely different, the way the ordinances are run are lost, doctrines lost, authorities lost, priesthood lost. And it's, it's, a, it's an interesting way to see what happens when you lose authority and priesthood. So, okay, so this is less than 400 years after the death of the Savior. So you can look on the screen. It's on the screen, but um, and you might know already what was happening at the same time around 400 A.D. in another part of the world. So in Jerusalem, we have this apostasy going on. What was happening in on the other side of the world? 400 AD. I'm also in apostasy with the Nephites and their open rebellion and their destruction. Mm -hmm. Right. It was it's very similar things going on, right? They had the um, three disciples that Christ left on the earth, and those they were taken. You had people like Mormon who had seen the Savior, who had had spiritual experiences, who was who had was still on the right track, but they were these prophets like Mormon were told to be quiet, close their mouths, and they had to be silent and literally watch this apostasy. So both there was an apostasy going on on both the in the New World and in the Old World. Um, so that's what we start in the the our, the Latter Day Church. We call it the Great Apostasy, right? And the term apostasy means turning away from the truth, right? So, and it was the the biggest thing that happened, what we've already mentioned, is the loss of the authority, right? So you had, and you had different groups, like you had the Waldensian people in the Alps, and you had a couple other groups um, on the island of Iona, up near Scotland. You had different pockets of people who were trying to hold on to the truth, hold on to the scripture, hold on to the authority, but when the authority got withdrawn, it was only a matter of time before that it just all turned downhill. So 
They didn't have divine direction from living prophets. Now, why would that be so important, right? Because you can still pray and get promptings yourself. So why is it so important that you have authority? Because just because you receive revelation doesn't mean that revelation is for everyone. Right. <laughs> Perfect. Exactly, right? So no one was keeping the church together. So you had just people off by themselves. You also had, did people really have the Holy Ghost? They probably thought they had the Holy Ghost. But what do you, what has to happen in order to get the Holy Ghost? You have to have the laying on of hands. Right. And can anybody just do that because they feel like it? Right. Rodney's right. You have to have the priesthood authority. Things happen with order. Christ's church is a church of order, and if you don't follow the order, you don't get the results. Um, and that's so critical to understand, the principle of key, keys, and that's what we are going to be talking about. And it's especially critical today because there is a huge groups of people right now as we're sitting here, hundreds and hundreds of people um, leaving the church as we speak over this issue of keys, where they don't think keys are that important. They think authority can just come by personal revelation, or they don't think authority is that important. They don't believe that maybe the prophet doesn't have the keys anymore or maybe someone else has the keys. And so they're leaving the church by droves. So this is a big, big issue right now. Um, it's very important. Now, what do we know will never happen that happened during the great apostasy that won't happen in the future? The leaders of the church will never lead the church astray. That was the Lord's promise. Right. The president of the church and the majority of the 12 you can um, stick with. And why can you stay with the president of the church? What does he have that won't be taken, that was taken during the great apostasy? Keys. Perfect, Annika. Right. The keys. Very important. Um, why do you think they're called keys? Right. They're not like physical keys to open up a bank safe or something. Why? What do, you, what do you do with keys? What's the symbolism of calling them keys? Right. They unlock stuff. They, they open revelations. It's almost like they open the windows of heaven, sort of. Mm-hmm. Right. And let's say... A house is locked with a key. Now, we're not talking about breaking into the house, so, but there wouldn't be a way to get through that door, right, to get into it, to get maybe, or let's say you have your bedroom is locked, right? You can't get in there to get what you need without the keys. It's the same thing with the president of the church. You can't have the ordinances. You can't have the priesthood. You can't have marriage sealing. You can't get baptized. You can't get the gift of the Holy Ghost without the keys. Um, you can't get the gift of the Holy Ghost, right? So member people, uh, men and women around the world who are not members of the church at times will have the Holy Ghost, right? But it will leave. Um, they might have it for a small portion or um, on, on rare occasions, but it's not something they have a right to keep with them at all times and in all places if they're worthy, right? That's what we have the privilege of having through the keys and through the authority as members of the church is when you get the gift of the Holy Ghost, you have the right to have the Holy Ghost with you at all times and in all places if you are clean and worthy. Um, so that's, and that's so important, right? Because if you don't have the Holy Ghost, what gets stopped? The truth. The truth, revelation. What, what else is part of the Holy Ghost mission? To witness of Christ. To witness of Christ, right? So you can't get that witness um, of knowing Christ without the shadow of a doubt, right? Being coming into the presence of God. What else? Does anyone does anyone know the five missions of the Holy Ghost? So, um, Emma, I think was that you who just said a witness of Christ, or was that someone else? I think it was. Right. 
sorry. Whoever, whoever said. So that's, yeah, it was me. Sorry. No, perfect, Emma. That's exactly right. So, so Emma got two of them, right? So the Holy Ghost is a testator. He testifies of Christ. And he's also a revealer of Christ. So he helps us come to know Christ. Um, there's three other missions of the Holy Ghost. Comforter, Annika, good job. Hunter, got it too. Um, what was that Moses scripture? I'm sorry, I'm not in seminary yet, so I haven't got it memorized. But yeah. it was like, um, bring to, ugh, gosh, I wish I had a better memory. To bring to life the eternal life of men or something like that. Yeah, the work and the glory of God is bring to pass the immortality and eternal life of man, right? So, right, so everything the Holy Ghost does is directly tied with that mission. So the other two things he does is he's a sealer, so he he's there to seal covenants. So when you make um, the marriage covenant, when you make when you go to the temple, when you your baptismal covenant, he's the one who can seal those covenants. And if he's not there to seal it, it doesn't really matter. It's no different than saying it's just words, right? And then the other thing he is is... Um, He's a purifier. He's a cleanser. He's the one who will burn out and change your nature. So without the Holy Ghost, you can't become a new creature. You can't have your complete personality changed. And that's critical, right? Because if you lose that, you're, you're, you're essentially damned, right? Damned just means you can't progress further. So without the Holy Ghost, you literally have... Thousands and thousands and thousands of people whose eternal life and ability to access eternal life is completely stopped. And that's one of the reasons why this was such a big deal. And so um, has anyone seen the, the video produced by the church about Wilford Woodruff's search for the truth? I think it's called Search for the Truth. And it's Wilford Woodruff's story of how he was converted. Okay, Rodney has. Has anybody else? Okay, Emma has. Yeah, for those who haven't seen it, go. Um, it's on YouTube or on the church's website. Um, definitely go and watch it. It's a really, it's a, it's an amazing movie. But there's a scene in the movie where Wilford Woodruff is talking to his brother, and he's they're sit and they're they've been studying the scriptures. This is before they've accessed the Book of Mormon or um, missionaries, and they've been studying the Bible and they've been studying the New Testament and what it says about how you have to have the authority. You have to have the keys to be able to be baptized, to be able to gain exaltation. And they're realizing this and they're realizing no one has the keys. No one has the authority right now. And it's this very, it's this gripping scene because as they're realizing this, as Wilfred Woodruff and his brother Asman are realizing this, Wilford Woodruff just stops, and he says, are we damned, Asman, right? So this, and it's it's the sobering moment, and they just sit there for a second in silence as they're realizing our salvation is at stake, and we can't access it because we don't have the keys and the authority. And this is why, this is something a lot of us take for granted, right? Because it's part of our lives, we see it, we have people in our lives who have the priesthood, and we don't realize the calamity without those keys and without um, a leadership and without direction and without um, revelation and without true priesthood authority. So this is, and this is something that Joseph Smith was not the first person to realize. There were many and many. John Wesley, who was a reformer, um, he realized that. Um, Martin Luther, a lot of these famous reformers that you hear about, when you read their letters and their journals and their writings, they were very, very, very concerned because they realized their salvation was stopped because they lived in a period of apostasy. Um, the pilgrims, the Puritans, a lot of them felt this as well. And so Paul talked about this, and he said a second coming, um, the second coming can't happen, right? The last days can't happen until there's a falling away first. Um, now, he says, let no man deceive you by any means. Why do you think he was so concerned that he, he, why did he feel it was so important for people to understand this falling away was going to happen? Uh, 
I think he was so concerned because, you know, it would happen, mm -hmm. and, you know, it would lead people away if they weren't prepared. Um, and, you know, I think mankind has always been lenient towards the people who seem educated, who seem very um, well taught. And it's just like one of our natural instincts is to go, oh, he seems he seems to know everything, so he must be right. But we know that sometimes that isn't always true. Mm -hmm. um, we have to have faith in certain things, and not everything can be answered in this time. Right. Right. So Emma Hunter, you both hit it right. Um, this it's this confusion. It's this, and without people being able to discern correctly, discern. Okay, this is someone with authority, and this is someone without the authority. Um, you're you're deceived, right? And that's what happened to millions and millions of people during the Dark Ages. Many of them were deceived because they thought they were following people with authority, and they weren't. And it had disastrous consequences for freedom, right? This is a, so the same thing is happening within the with um, freedom and liberty. At the same time, the gospel um, is taken away, and the priesthood keys is the same time, the exact same time, the world is coming under. Um, tyranny and their their freedoms are being taken away and those freedoms never came back until the reformation started and they started turning back to the scriptures and that's why it was so significant so during the period of persecution we talked about last week right they're being persecuted they're being tortured they're being killed um, the church is becoming corrupt they don't have the doctrines are not being kept pure um, what are some doctrines that you know of that were corrupted during the Dark Ages? Baptism. Baptism. Perfect. Right. Sacrament. The nature of the Godhead. Exactly. These are all things that really got skewed into weird interpretations, right, without without the scriptures um, and without the authority to keep it on track. Um, now, Peter and Paul, they saw this happening. So it's, it's interesting to remember they are alive while this is happening, and they're writing letters and they're writing epistles, and they're saying, please, don't listen to this falsehood. That's not true. Stay on the straight and narrow path, right? And, um, and that's why it's so important in our day, too, right? You know the doctrine. You understand how authority works, how keys work. How is instruction supposed to come? Does it go just from the prophet straight to your bishop? Does it go um, from the state president to your father? How does, it, how does the chain of authority even work? Because if you don't, there are people who will be coming who will try to who will present other forms of the gospel or other forms of how it's supposed to work. And if you don't know the truth, you'll be deceived. And that's what happened with so many um, members of the church during Peter and Paul's day. Um, so Peter, he's crucified in Rome, right? Apostle Paul dies in prison. You have John the Beloved. He, he wasn't um, killed. We know he's still alive today. But you had um, Baroni. Mormon and Moroni, their whole nation is apostatizing. So it really goes into this dark time. And if you think about it, as the light of the gospel is being taken, the light in all other areas of life and thought are being is being diminished, but sorry, diminished as well, right? So you have scientific inventions, you have freedom, you have um, literature literature, music, you have all these different areas and they're all going into a period of darkness the same time the gospel is being taken. Why would there be a connection between the two or was that just a coincidence that that happened? Um, there's a mighty big connection because we know that um, light or truth comes with uh, obeying the gospel and mm -hmm. listening to the Holy Ghost. And all truth has been revealed, and God knows it, and he reveals it to us. Right. And I, um, so as we lose that light, 
we can't receive anything more. Mm -hmm. In fact, we regress a little bit. I think that's the scriptures in, um, in uh, the Book of Mormon. I can't remember where it is, but I think it's in Alma. When Amulekers um, talking, I don't know, but he's talking about that. If you think you don't, if you think you have enough, then the Lord won't give you any more. Right. In fact, you'll lose some, some until you don't have anything. Mm -hmm. Take what He's given you. You do it. You ask for more. He'll give you more and more until up the perfect day. And so, in this time, we're losing light, and so we're losing independent thought and uh, being able to in invent and create like he does. Right. And you see it going down, right? You see um, the medical field was like um, Annika's saying, right? Instead of accelerating, going, so going forward, you're going backward, right? So you see in all of these areas, and that's so important to realize because in our own day, you can think, okay, I want to go into this field or that field. Um, remember that, that your ability to excel, your ability to make a difference is directly connected to your spiritual um, level. Is the greater of character you have, the greater um, difference and the greater intelligence and the greater wisdom you're going to have. Okay, so you have... John the Beloved, John the Revelator. So while Christ was dying on the cross, he gives John the divine, um, a specific mandate to take care of his mother, right? And he promises John that he's going to be able to live until Christ comes again at the second coming, right? So he writes the book of Revelation. Um, and the book of Revelation is very interesting. It's, it's, it's a fascinating, it sometimes can be hard because, it, again, it uses symbolism. It uses um, symbolism. But the book of Revelation is all about the last days and the pre-mortal life and all of that. And there's all these hidden treasures all through it. And after writing the book of Revelation, John sends this to the churches to help strengthen them. Rodney, are you asking how to get the book of Revelation? No, how did I'm we just get kidding. It? I'm just kidding, Rodney. <laughs> just giving you a hard time. Now, how did we get the book? I mean, if he was trapped on an island, why couldn't in he was the only one on the island, and if they came to him and picked up the book, why didn't they just take him with them? Good question. Do you want to look that up and let us know next week? I don't know. The, the Catholic Church still thinks he was left on that island. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, that would be interesting. I, that, that would be an interesting thing to look up and say, see if we know. Or, um, yeah, I, I'm sure we know at least kind of through to trace history where the book of Revelation specifically came through what hands, but yeah, or paper airplanes as some are proposing. That's, that's one theory, but maybe. <laughs> okay. So the doctrines are being corrupted, right? Unauthorized changes are being made in priesthood ordinances. Um, they're introducing Greek philosophy, pagan religions, um, pagan um, education methods. Um, pagan ordinances, pagan ceremonies, and they're trying to merge this with the church. And that's what you see the great danger, the great, great danger you'll start, start seeing through. Um, they're known as the great church fathers, um, Augustine, and you have these different um, great thinkers, and they're called great, but they're not really that great because they corrupted. They were trying to mix um, Greek with the message of the gospel, which didn't really gel that well um, without corrupting the original truth. So you have infant baptism, Emma mentioned. Um, you have um, these pagan influences. You have burning incense. You have, um, it's really, it's very interesting because Satan really did kind of the opposite, right? So we understand that marriage and family are very important. They're critical. They're one of the most important parts of life. And so what did the corrupt version of it say? No, marriage and family are not good. You need to remain single. That's the Remaining single is the sign of being truly holy, right? Um, you have the belief that the body is just evil and that you've just got to get, just get rid of this instead of understanding that true exaltation comes when you've perfected the body and the spirit together. 
um, you had the honoring of martyrs turning into superstition and worship, right? So they were worshiping these ancestors, worshiping these martyrs, worshiping um, people who were probably initially good, some of them, like Perpetua and a couple, even the apostles, right? But they turned them into their objects of worship instead of worshiping the Father. Um, you had the idea of doing confession, right? Where you didn't really need to, it was the, uh, the Satan, people always want the easy way out, right? So we understand that the Lord teaches that in order to be saved, you have to change, right? You have to confess your sins, forsake them, um, and literally have a change of heart and change your nature, change what you're doing and turn away from um, weaknesses or mistakes that um, all of us make every day, right? Now, the that's hard work. That's a lot of hard work, right? So what does Satan do? He introduces the easy version, right? And you see this um, as one of the pagan influences that came in, the whole idea of right confession, right? You just go to this mentor, essentially, right? Your priest, you just go to this leader, this um, mentor, just talk through the things that have been going wrong in your life, and by the end, um, basically just give it off to Christ, give it off to the saints, and move on with your life, right? And that's, that's a counterfeit. People think, okay, well, I'll, I can do that. That, that. that makes it a lot easier than having to actually work through it and change, right? So you have all this wickedness coming in. You have the gifts of the Spirit. Now, it's important while you're studying these different pagan influences, we might not see every single one of these in the exact same form in our day, but the corrupt, the principles, Satan's principles behind all of these pagan influences are alive and well in our day just as much as they were um, during the age of the great apostasy. So it's really important that as we're going through these, you understand, okay, do I understand what the true, correct um, principle and doctrine is behind this? And so that I can be able to discern that in our own day because Satan is always very tricky, right? He's smarter than any of us realize. So the problem is the other thing, What another one of the results is people start to deny true spiritual gifts. What do you think that means when it says they began to deny true spiritual gifts? Well, here's a good example. In the book we're reading in a literature, mm -hmm. um, Joan of Arc, don't believe that the Holy Ghost could speak to anyone or they could receive revelation. Mm -hmm. um, the signs and wonders, sometimes they'd call it the works of Satan because they're so different. Mm -hmm. But kind of interesting because Satan doesn't do anything unless it's appealing and familiar. But Heavenly Father doesn't mind introducing something strange. Right, right. And so why do you think they were so eager um, to deny these spiritual gifts? So different things like visions and speaking in tongues and angels coming and um, the other gifts of the Spirit, right? Prophecy, you have true, all the different um, gifts. Why do you think they were so eagle, eager to discount those? Mankind, how do I describe it? Mankind are not always very open. Um, they they go over this notion, and I think we all tend to do that seeing is believing in something that is not tangible to them, something that they cannot physically see or recognize, sounds so foreign that they just deny it altogether. Right. Perfect. So I'm going to ask a follow-up question. Why was it so foreign to them? In other words, I think what you're saying, Emma, right, is they hadn't experienced it themselves, so they didn't believe anyone else could, right? Why weren't those spiritual gifts happening to them? I would think because they weren't being very open. You know, if you're not open, mm -hmm. then you're not allowing 
you're not allowing the spirit to come into you because the spirit technically only comes to you when you're most vulnerable. And so if they harden their hearts, they're not going to be able to understand the message. They're just going to ignore it and just deny it altogether. Right, right. It all go back, goes back to that first thing mentioned in the last paragraph. What's that? Right? Wickedness. Anytime there's a lack of spiritual gifts, it always, the scriptures teach it, always is because of wickedness. Um, this is the same, so we saw the same thing happening in the Book of Mormon. Um, miracles weren't happening. So um, Mormon, he's talking to his own people, and he's saying, you think miracles aren't happening, and you think the day of miracles has passed? He said, it's because you guys are so wicked. That's why the miracles are not happening. And he says, change, repent, start obeying God, and you will see the miracles. If you don't see miracles, it's not because they don't happen. It's because um, you're not you're not living worthy enough to be able to see those. Now, that's, that's hard, right? That's sometimes hard for um, any of us to realize and go, wow. You know, it's always hard to write, to hear you're doing something wrong or to hear, oh, maybe it's my fault, right? When you, It's easy to want to blame it on other people, right? And so it depends, it goes back to like Emma was saying, being open, being humble, being really teachable, being willing to say, okay, this isn't happening to me. I, that means I need to change. Lord, what do you want me to change? And then the Lord will just open it up and just pour it out. And that's why during the dark ages, there were some cases of spiritual gifts. There were some cases of healing and um, speaking in tongues and visions and angels and dreams. Um, those things happened to people who were willing to be righteous, who were willing to make the sacrifices necessary to get the scriptures, right? And it was a lot harder in that day to be a true Christian. It was as we're, as we're going to see, right, right? The, the Catholic Church is, is establishes itself, so it's impossible not to be a Christian, right? If you're not a Christian by the name and the culture, you're ostracized, right? You see this with a lot of the Muslims and a lot of the other Jews. But were they really Christians? No. The Christianity was just a label. It wasn't who they really were. So people who are willing to go against the flow, be really be different, and really say, okay, I want to know what scripture says and I want to follow scripture. Those were the people who made the sacrifices. And when they made those sacrifices, they got the gifts. Um, but still, they were still stumbling in the dark, right? Even the very best of them, the ones that were paying the most, the dearest prices, who were being tortured or um, like in the Spanish Inquisition or other of the reformers who were literally dying um, for the sake of scripture and for Jesus Christ, they were still stumbling in the dark, right? Because they didn't have the church organization. They didn't have the keys. So the years after the apostles died, you can just see really good evidence. It's very obvious that things were going downhill. Everything, the principles are being corrupted. The spiritual gifts are disappearing. Um, changes in the church organization are going on. And you have the Nicene Council. Now, the Nicene Council, take the Nicene Council and compare it with Sharon in the Book of Mormon, and you're going to find a very perfect parallel. Um, the Nicene Council happened. You have Emperor Constantine, right? Now, Constantine a lot of times is held up as, okay, maybe not the greatest hero, but he's still an okay guy. Well, if you read the history, right, Constantine, he, he was a murderer. And so he's the one who calls together this council where they're going to determine the nature of the Godhead. Now, I'm not sure about you, but I don't know if I would trust a murderer to tell me about the nature of the Godhead, right? Right, Hunter. So there's it's not known as the Nicaea Creed. There's the Nicene Council. Um, it was took place in Nicaea. So sometimes it's referred to as the Nicaea Creed, and then sometimes it's the Nicene Council is the official um, name of this council. So he just basically got together all these different bishops and people who are essentially, you know, the warlords of the time who had triumphed over other people and um, killed their opponents. And 
they're having some disagreement about whether God was one individual or three individuals and um, how this worked with the Trinity. And so they get together and they decide what the official doctrine is going to be. Now, <laughs> right, we understand this is not how doctrine gets decided, right? You don't just get together in a room and by democratic vote decide what's supposed to happen, right? You have, right, Rodney, General Conference, the apostate version. Um, Emma says, perfect. Emma says, I wouldn't feel comfortable determining the nature of the Godhead anyway, murder or not. Exactly, Emma, right? None of us are wise enough to be able to decide what the nature of the Godhead is, right? It's it's not something you can decide. Um, it's, it's truth that you can learn, and you can learn by um, living worthy and having that revealed to you, but it's not something you can just get together and decide. So, this, but the Nicene Creed is really this big turning point because this is really when you see um, the doctrine that's going to be t to take premacy over everything else get established during the Dark Ages. So this is really one of the monumental events that you can look to and say, okay, this really shows us just how far the apostasy had taken them from the original truths of the gospel. So in the Book of Mormon, you have the same thing. Anyone who would not deny Jesus Christ was killed. The three disciples are taken, and Moroni is the only one left, right? Now, if, if you want to study, if, while you're studying the Nicene Creed and you're studying these the apostate doctrines that got introduced, if you want the true version of it, read the Book of Mormon and read the Book of um And when I say the Book of Mormon, I mean not just the Book of Mormon in general, but the Book of Mormon in the Book of Mormon, and the Book of Moroni, um, because they both explain perfectly how baptism is supposed to work, how to decide when a person is ready to be baptized, how, um, how to work out difficulties in the church, church discipline, understand all of these doctrines, right? And it's about going back to the source, going back to truth. Now, Paul tells Timothy, right, he says, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. They can't endure it. They can't handle it. It's Why do you think they got to the point to where they couldn't endure it? They couldn't even handle having that sound doctrine. Lust, right. Essentially, we have wicked... Because we tend to question almost everything. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry. No, go ahead, Emma. Perfect. Yeah, I was just going to say, you know, we often tend to question everything because, um, not only because sometimes when we're not doing the right thing, it's hard for us to understand, mm -hmm. but just because sometimes um, we as humans, we're not satisfied with just knowing the basics. We want to know more, when sometimes the more isn't always best for us. We can't just take what we have. We are constantly trying to innovate and um, make changes when that's not always the best. Mm -hmm. Right, you have to be worthy and ready for it, right? And I think we talked about this either last week or a couple weeks ago. The Lord wants to teach us more, right? The Lord, um, right, that's all through all the standard works. He says, ask and you will receive. Knock and it will be open to you. He says over and over and over, just be ready. But if we're not putting, being ready doesn't mean wanting. Just wanting to know more doesn't mean you're ready for it, right? You've got to be in a position to where you're living according to all of the light you had so that the Lord can give you more light. And so you have these people who are literally trying to hush up. They're trying to destroy the sound doctrine. They're trying to destroy light. And why are they trying to destroy light? They're trying to destroy light because they because light exposes darkness, and they want to stay in the darkness. They want to keep their sins hiding. That is why, you know, when I was growing up, if there's one thing that my dad emphasized more than any other character trait in the world, it was honesty. Because he said, at the end of the day, if you are not 100% honest, 100% honest, you will not be able to progress. You will, you will degress. Um, because it's the wicked who want to hide in the darkness. They want to keep their sins covered up. They want to keep who they really are covered up in the darkness. They want to hide. They want to lie. They want to deceive. And it's Christ who's the light. He's the one who shines it, and the darkness has to leave. 
and it exposes, right? When you when you have light in when when a room is dark, you can't discern things clearly. It's confusing, it's gray, it's complex. But when the light shows up, it's very easy to figure out what's going on, right? That's the same thing with um, all these doctrines. If there's anything ever in your life that it feels confusing, it feels really complicated, complex, you always know, okay, what we need is some light because we need... Christ to come in, turn the light bulb on, and be able to see things. But to be able to see that, you have to be righteous. You have to be living a pure life. Because otherwise, you won't be able to endure the sound doctrine. So this is all to different degrees. Um, Peter, Paul tells Timothy, he says, they will turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables, right? So, and that's really what you saw during the um, during the dark ages and you really saw this also during the 18 and 1900s the same time um, Joseph Smith was restoring the church you had all of these um, quote-unquote great thinkers coming on saying the scriptures are just a bunch of fairy tales they're figurative Noah's flood didn't really happen um, the video games didn't um, Right, Hunter says um, the video game. Right? Um, this time. Yeah, go ahead, Nathan. What time are we? Are, are we still in class at two? Yes. Go oh, hi. Three. It's making food because it seems like it seemed like it seemed like for a minute that we were in the middle of a class. Yeah, we started today around uh, two oh eight, but. And I am recording it, so if um, if you need to watch the recording, it, they'll be up on YouTube. I'm getting them up this week and next week. So, okay. So Joseph Fielding Smith, he says the results of the apostasy were devastating. Right? You have all of these serious consequences. Um, I'm gonna skip ahead really quick. So we. You, you all know Joseph Smith came back over Cowdery. This was really significant because you had Peter and James and John coming back and giving back the keys. Um, Joseph Fielding Smith offered this amazing testimony. He says, I have a perfect knowledge of the divine mission of the prophet Joseph Smith. Uh, there is no doubt in my mind that the Lord raised him up and gave him revelation, commandment, open the heavens to him. Um, this is really significant because if you read, sir, when you read the book of Isaiah, especially the chapters that are included in the Book of Mormon, it's always talking about the servant, the servant that's going to restore things, the servant that's going to bring light, that's going to destroy the darkness. And that servant, um, all evidence points to that servant being Joseph Smith. And it's, so it's really important if there's one person that you can would decide to study um, just in your casual studies for um, – or at more academic studies, Joseph Smith would be, understand Joseph Smith's position on government, understand his position on the family, understand his position on health, understand his position on church organization and structure, because he's the one who knew it best, because he was the one raised up to restore everything, take everything from darkness to light. And Joseph Smith told us that he only revealed a hundredth part. That means he only revealed 1% of everything that he knew, right? And you think about everything we have that Joseph Smith did give us, um, like with the Joseph Smith papers that the church is bringing out. And he's really the one who gave us the Book of Mormon, the Doctrine and Covenants, a large portion of the Bible, the Pearl of Great Price, the Joseph Smith translation. He gave us a lot, but he only gave us 1% of what he actually knew, right? So that just shows you, wait a minute, there's a lot more out there than we're not even, we are not even scratching the surface. Um, and so it's really important to realize that. So in our own day, following that with the question, okay, are we free from apostasy today? From, it's kind of like a trick question, huh? Because it's. Uh, it's talking about personal apostasy, yes, and 
restored church will not apostatize, but there are churches that are still in apostasy. See how that's like really tricky? Yes. <laughs> you have to answer it three times. <laughs> right. Yes, yes, and no. <laughs> right. And even um, inside, right, even as uh, in, in inside the church, we're still, if we only got 1% of what Joseph Smith taught, and most of us, including myself, we don't even know, you know, 10, 20% of what Joseph Smith did give us. That's like 0.01%, right, that we know. So it's definitely something that we need to understand. We're in a period of trying to, we're still trying to figure things out. Sometimes it's easy to think, you know, we've arrived, we're very intelligent, we're very smart, and realize there's a whole, we haven't even began this, we haven't even began to approach the universe, um, the universes of knowledge that Christ had, that Joseph Smith had. And that's that's why it's so exciting. The era that we're living in right now, it, this is the restoration age. That's why it's called the period of restoration. Joseph Smith said his mission was bringing back everything that was had in every other dispensation. So everything Adam had, everything Abraham had, everything um, Christ gave, brought, everything Moses brought, everything bringing it all together and restoring it. Now, did he do that during his life if he only revealed to us 1% of what he knew? Right, Rod, Rodney says no, no. Ah, wait, does that mean Joseph Smith failed his mission? I thought Joseph not, Smith was supposed to restore it all. Go ahead, Ronnie. He's not done yet. I've been able to study what, what some of the things that are going to happen before the second coming, mm -hmm. one of which is Joseph Smith will come back. He will not preside over the church, but he'll be working with the prophet along with the other apostles. Right. And, uh, you know, there's a Doctrine and Covenant section, and Joseph Smith asks Jesus Christ, Heavenly Father, and I'm like, when is the second coming going to happen? And he said, well, probably in your, like, 82nd year. Well, he, he died in his 32nd year. Yeah, too bad, huh? <laughs> <laughs> and so whenever he comes back, I wonder. Mm-hmm. At the same time, we don't know when he's coming back, so I don't know. <laughs> I know. I, I hope I'm still around when he comes back, because that would be, I think, one of the most fantastic experiences of your life you could ever have. But, um, right, so Ronnie's right. There are many, many proxies from Brigham Young and Heber C. Kimball um, talking about how Joseph Smith is going to be coming back. And the other interesting thing is he is going to be ruling not over just the people for this dispensation, but over the entire history of the world. So Adam is even underneath him. So when you study some of these prophecies, it's fascinating. Um, you know how during uh, Joseph of Egypt, when you had the Pharaoh, who was king over everything, and then you had Joseph underneath him, and Joseph had authority. He wasn't as great as Pharaoh, but he still had authority in running the kingdom, right? That's a parallel at least I believe that's a parallel, and I believe I have good evidence to support that from the scriptures, that that's a parallel for during the millennium we'll have Christ, who is the king. Christ is definitely the king. And Joseph Smith is his servant underneath him. And we have quotes talking about how Joseph and Hiram and Brigham Young and Heber C. Kimball are going to be ruling in Jerusalem, ruling in the new Jerusalem, directing the affairs of the government, directing the affairs of the church, the administration. Um, he's the one who will be giving out people their land inheritance, inheritances, um, where there's a Zion estates, because everyone will have their own piece of Zion, right, that are worthy to live there. And so this is very exciting. Now, what does this have to do with us? Right now, there are huge attacks on Joseph Smith and Brigham Young and the other um, early leaders. Why do you think people would be attacking their character. Like, who cares? It's funny the way the English language is, huh? Who cares? It's all they have is their character. <laughs> you should be caring about that. 
Um, it, I was really thinking about this. We were talking about Paul trying to tell the saints to not be deceived. There will be a falling away. Don't get lured away. It's like he's almost repeating or or he's saying the same things the last few general conferences have been saying. Right. Follow the prophets. Mm -hmm. Don't go ahead of them. Don't go your own way. It's not right. And so, with them trying to attack Joseph Smith mm -hmm. and Brigham Young, they being the founding prophets of this dispensation, you take that foundation out and it all crumbles apart. Right. They're trying to destroy the foundation. Mm-hmm. Because if you destroy their character, you've destroyed their truth and the principles they were trying to teach, right? And so there's a quote. There was a prophecy by Heber C. Kimball, and he said what's going to happen is, now if you remember, okay, before I give you the what Heber C. Kimball said, remember the parable of the ten virgins, right? One of you, I don't remember who, but referenced the ten virgins from earlier. Christian. Christian. Perfect. Thank you, Christian. So when the... When the bridegroom came, how many of the ten virgins, what number of the ten virgins were asleep? Five. Close. Oh, all of them. Sorry, all of them were asleep. Exactly, Ronnie. Good job. It's a trick question, right? And all ten virgins were asleep. Now, what are the ten virgins a symbol of in our day? The church membership. Right. It's perfect, right? So in our, and that's what he present, so understanding that with that parable, right? Um, it's, and it doesn't mean um, all ten are, like, in apostasy. That's not what it means by asleep. Asleep just means you're in a state of stupor, not realizing everything that's going on. So he, President Kimball, he said the same thing. He said, we have the best people in this church. He said, in the future, he said, they're going to be asleep. He said, they're not going to realize, but he said, but the Lord is going to wake them up. And when they wake up, he said, all of the young men, and um, and I'm sure he's including the young women here too, all the young men, young women, they're going to rise up. And he said, and they're going to stand and they're going to defend the true character of Joseph Smith, Brigham Young, Huber C. Kimball, and then he listed a couple other of the early leaders. And he said, and they're going to, and you connect this with other prophecies about saving the Constitution and about um, bringing back and really reestablishing Zion, right? Now, I really feel that all of you in this class right now, you are part of those young men and young women who are, you know, to one degree or another, a lot of us, including myself, we're asleep, right? We're not realizing how critical it is. We're not realizing um, out there making as a big of a difference as we could. but we are the fulfillment, the embodiment of these prophecies that are that the prophets have made in the past. So when like President Hinckley gets up and says, you guys are a choice generation, that's not just something to go, oh, pat yourself on the back and forget about it, right? That means you have big responsibilities, you have big duties. And one of those duties is to defend the character and the um, name of Joseph Smith and Brigham Young and be able to stand up and explain and teach people and share and um, why, they're, why they did have true character. People say, um, many scholars, even LES scholars say Joseph Smith was arrogant, he was boastful, he was prideful, and he was just like us, right? He was just like you and I, he wasn't that great of a character, but when you study history, you learn, no, 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 Joseph Smith's character was incredible. He was the most righteous person, except for the Savior. Except for the Savior, he was the most righteous person ever to live. So being able to understand that and spread the truth, because the, that truth is so critical in helping complete the restoration. We're still in the midst of the restoration right now. We're still part of that marvelous work and a wonder, and every single one of us have a big, big role in that. So keep up the great work and move forward. Anyone have a last comment before we close? I typed in a comment. Okay. Do you want to verbally repeat what you were saying? Would that be okay? I was just trying to write down what I was talking about. It, was like, it says, if anyone's character is destroyed, who cares what they said? 
They're liars, right? Oh, I moved. But if their character is true and reliable, you better care what they have to say. Right. And so talking about Joseph Smith, we need to know for ourselves. Mm-hmm. If we don't, we don't have a basis. Perfect. Hunter says, I wrote a comment. Oh, my. <laughs> Perfect. Anyone else have a last comment? Hunter doesn't. Hunter, does that mean you really do? Do I need to call on you specifically? Just kidding. <laughs> okay, well, somebody's eager to get out of class. Okay, let's say the closing prayer then. <laughs> Okay, go ahead. Um, I'm not even going to try to pronounce the name. I'm not going to even embarrass myself enough to try to pronounce the name. But the one who wants their little brother to, whose little brother wants to say their prayer, go ahead. Go for it. Xenolith. Excuse me, Father, thank you for this day. Thank you that we could have a great day today, and thank you that we could have class and that could be fun. And um, please help us to have a great uh, rest of the day. And I say these things, and I just stress them in. Bye. Yeah. Okay.